Hey everyone, Noah here. I just wanted to give a quick thank you to everyone who has interacted with my channel in the last couple weeks. There's been some crazy growth. Before I posted this last kind of nihilism video a few weeks back, I was sitting at around, you know, 40 subscribers, and we are looking at like, you know, five times that right now, and that's insane to me. You guys have blown me away, and I'm, I'm super thankful. I'll let the video go on. Today we're asking the question, how would a transhumanist play Fallout New Vegas? Or if you read the thumbnail, how would Elon Musk play Fallout? I'll elaborate on transhumanism more as we go, but I first wanted to give a bite-sized definition for those of you who are unfamiliar with the movement. Transhumanism sees technological progress as inevitable, and it sees it as a way of bringing about a new stage of humanity. This can take many different forms from artificial extension of life, enhanced human abilities, and being uploaded to the matrix. To support this vision, I've selected a few rules that will help us embody the transhumanists through our playthrough, and with a few kind of other mini challenges scattered through. Rule number one is we're going to play on hardcore mode, just to kind of get some extra difficulty in, and to kind of make sense of some of these further rules. Number two, we're going to play on the hardest difficulty available, I believe off the top of my head that's very hard, but it's not going to make too too much of a difference. Number three, we have to buy every implant available to us. This is just to kind of fulfill the fantasy of becoming a cyborg in the, the transhumanist thought. Number four, we're going to use energy weapons as much as possible, which is basically throughout the entire playthrough. There's only one moment where I shoot a gun. Uh, it's for Sunny Smiles quest to shoot a bottle, but otherwise we're using energy weapons. Number five, we're never touching a lock. Uh, lock picking is too physical for us. We we want to uh, deal totally with technology. This isn't really for roleplay. This is just more uh, restrictions to help me get into the mindset. Number six, we're gonna eat only pre-processed food, such as Blamco mac and cheese, or those deviled eggs that come in a box. This is more for, again, for immersion. I don't want to deal with the dirty food. We're going to use food that's only from the past, the, the far past. And number seven, we're going to, as we've mentioned before, generally act as a transhumanist would. And again, we'll define this as we go. As Fallout New Vegas begins, we are shot by the late Matthew Perry and then we are subsequently saved by a robot named Victor. He'll be important later as we go, but Doc Mitchell removes the lead from our brain before sending us into the wasteland. But before we get to this, we first need to tell him our name. To start out, we're going to name ourselves after the most famous pop transhumanist kind of character of our time and do our best to copy his face into this not very good editor. We answer a few pertinent questions to Doc Mitchell here and there, and we select our tag skills. With our focus on technology, we tag energy weapons, repair, and science. For traits, I choose four eyes, as eyeglasses are technology that human, humans use to make us more capable, and Logan's loophole, both for the reference to staying young forever, and for the ability to use drugs with no side effects. Drugs are another human enhancing technology, and we'll use them to good measure in the future. Also, I kind of skipped over our special stats. For the most part, you just need to know we took all the endurance we need to get all the implants. We have some healthy amounts of intelligence and luck, and everything else is relatively low, and we kept charisma about middling because we want companions to do an average amount of damage. We begin our journey taking supplies from Doc Mitchell, including a laser pistol and a bunch of drugs. As we exit the front door, we run into Victor, the mysterious robot who saved us, and decide quickly that whoever's interest Victor represents. We are definitely interested in looking into that. However, Good Springs does not have much to offer us. We hack a few computers, trade for some energy weapons, and move on our way. While I made before some strong claims that Elon Musk is a transhumanist, that might be a tough sell. While technologies like Neuralink definitely point towards transhumanism, Musk is publicly pessimistic about many other technologies, such as gene editing, 
which Musk seems ambivalent of. So, it may be better to say that Musk is a light transhumanist, or a futurist. I apologize for the clickbait, but I was desperate to find a recognizable face to play as. I'm not so sure if any of you would recognize, you know, the likes of Max Moore, Ray Kurzweil, Natasha Vita Moore, or Zoltan Istvan. You may be wondering why Zoltan here is standing in front of an American flag, and the answer is pretty simple. Zoltan has run for the presidency of the United States not once, but twice. Once in 2016 and once in 2020. As we make our way to get payback on the guy who shot us, we stop it by Prim and get our first impression of the NCR. From our perspective, the NCR is the most advanced faction we've run into. The NCR has the organization that we can see as the redevelopment of the world. We will later see that the NCR has resources and controls major landmarks that protect the continuation of civilization, and therefore human development. All of this is to say that we don't have a particular bone to pick with the NCR. However, this does not stop us from stealing supplies as we go in order to fuel our quest for technology. We next cross a bridge full of landmines, and swiftly deal with a few raiders while managing our meager amounts of ammunition. When we enter the headquarters for a previous employer, we come across a broken robot that catches our interest significantly, and quickly fix Eddie with some spare parts and some know-how. Eddie is just what we were hoping to find in this wasteland, some lost tech that can be repaired into a state to show everyone the grand importance of technology. With Eddie's help, we are able to quickly dispatch the Powder Gangers that are holding Deputy Beagle captive, and once we return to the Vicky and Vance Casino, we establish Prim Slim as the Sheriff proper. This was easy to do once we reprogrammed him. In our minds, this is the proper choice of leadership, as a robot with the intelligence of Slim's is properly unbiased and cannot be bribed. We leave Prim in good hands, and we set our sights on Nipton and Novak as we continue our roundabout way to New Vegas. Prometheus was a titan, ousted from his throne by the gods of Olympus, and as either a way to challenge them, or to take care of the cold and ignored infant humanity, he stole the divine fire of Olympus and gave it to these primitive human beings. While the gods punished Prometheus for his crime, it was too late. Humanity was already changed forever and would continue to develop into something completely distinct from the animals around them. In the mythology around the Jewish scriptures, there is a heavy association between Cain, of fratricide fame, and technology. He and his descendants are the founders of the first cities. Later, this would lead to the creation of Babel, a city whose inhabitants sought to surpass the divine through the use of highly advanced technology. Ancient stories like these leave little question why transhumanists seem to almost universally challenge all forms of ancient religion. Max Moore, a leader of the current transhumanist movement, has stated in no uncertain terms that traditional religion is a barrier to progress. This is a sentiment shared almost universally by the leaders of the transhumanist movement. The core of this conflict lies in the fact that transhumanism seeks to address with reason the very problems that religion was made to address as well. Zoltan's political platform has three pillars. Universal basic income for those who could no longer find jobs once automation took over. The development and distribution of implants to increase human capabilities such as running as fast as a cheetah. And finally, the absolute defeat of death. Again, this animosity is not surprising, you know, between transhumanism and religion, when you consider that religion has historically tried to provide either a solution or a challenge to each of these. Religion, traditionally, deals with death, seeks not to surpass certain human boundaries, and has a social structure that provides for people. Max Moore, the self-proclaimed coiner of the modern term transhumanism, defines it as both a reason-based philosophy and a cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally improving the human condition by means of science and technology. Transhumanists seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its current human form and human limitations by means of science and technology guided by life-promoting principles and values. To put it simply, 
transhumanism seeks to surpass traditional limitations through the use of technology. In this view, technology is a net good, and any improvement in this regard ought to be a priority. It is important then to ask, what is transhumanism really? A moral philosophy? A political philosophy? That's the question we're going to ask. Approaching the Mojave outpost, we are struck by the advances of the NCR. Traders have advanced weapons that we take advantage of, and we continue to offload our unused bullets. On our way out, we meet a scout that has a job for us. We are tasked with checking out Nipton, from which the outpost has not heard from in a while. We agree and begin on our way with our trustworthy companion, Eddie. In Nipton, we are confronted with the desolation of an entire community, and the cause? Caesar's Legion. Caesar's Legion is pretty close to challenging everything that we cherish the most. A primitive culture that seeks to emulate ancient history with no thought to what we find to be the most important marker of civilization, technology. In our experience, the Legion is an existential threat to the reason and humanism that undergirds our transhumanism. Despite this, we let them go on their way and we report what we see to the NCR we're best equipped to fight this threat. We quickly clear the town hall of Nipton, get some important ammo and guns, and then we head to Novak once we're done. On the way, we face a few brutal fights against more raiders, legion, and jackals. Though we limp away with a broken leg, we emerge victorious and finally make it to Novak of dinky fame. We run into Victor again in town and are further intrigued how did a robot beat us to Novak? And who is this benefactor that he seems to allude to? However, we have another task we came here for. We ask Manny Vargas about the whereabouts of Benny, and he asks us to deal with the continual problems of feral ghouls attacking the town from the Repcom test site. We quickly agree as soon as we smell technology. As we approach the building, we notice a few ghoul corpses holding sophisticated weaponry. And when we enter, we hear a voice over the intercom asking us to make our way to the top floor. It doesn't take a lot of convincing to get us to the side with this faction. We are slightly turned off by the vague nature of Jason's speech about migration to the great beyond, but it's clear that this is the most technologically savvy of any faction we've met so far. Though to us, ghouls have an unpleasant visage, they have adapted very well to the wasteland environment. If one can avoid becoming feral, it seems to us that becoming a ghoul is highly preferential. I mean, along with being a ghoul, you get a highly extended lifespan. So we are definitely impressed with these ghouls and we're wanting to help them however we can. We head to the basement, as we were told, in order to deal with the Nightkin. However, we run into something unexpected. The Nightkin also seem to be another potential improvement on the human formula though it seems that no bark struggles with schizophrenia. It may be preferable to keep these advanced creatures around if possible, not wanting to deal with another issue. We try and find the missing stealth boys for him, and are able to convince no bark of their absence once we find some evidence. Keeping the nightkin alive to potentially be saved another day from, you know, their schizophrenic tendencies. We continue to work with Jason to prepare for what we now understand to be a space flight to colonize another world. We are definitely on board now. We run a few errands to prepare our ghoul friends for their journey, and after a small correction to their flight plans, we send them on their way to a better tomorrow. Notably absent from transhumanist thought seems to be the discussion of the role an individual plays in society. Of course, there is a place for a scientist to continue the drive for technological development, and politicians to make sure they are well-funded and encouraged. However, what is asked of the common man? What does it mean for a simple farmer or businessman to be a transhumanist? How would he act differently than his neighbor? After much thought, I surmise that transhumanism seems to attract people who are seeking to make their own lives easier and more pleasant. While 
there is a priority to making sure that the progress is made on the technological front, the transhumanist movement moves much more towards self-improvement. Natasha Vita Moore, Max Moore's spouse, who was an accomplished thinker of her own right, had a seminar in which she advised that when one is pursuing these life-extending technologies in the future, we ought to wait until the processes are proven. In this way, we won't offer ourselves as guinea pigs. A majority of anti-aging products are patent pending. That means that they haven't been authorized. They're still waiting for their patents. And that's a very serious thing. So be careful. that's why the largest group I put is gather information, sit back and wait. Let other people be the guinea pigs. Don't do anything to your mind or body that you don't need because it could cause an adverse reaction. This is the sense I get from this. It's that we ought to be concerned first with our own survival and avoidance of death and let people who are more desperate kind of get into these front lines. This is why I made the choice for Musk, our character, not to be afraid to steal. His understanding is that his mission is to first maintain his own life as long as it does not conflict with the main priority of moving humanity along its evolutionary lines. Following Manny's directions, we head north to meet up with a crew of great cons out of Boulder City in order to find this Benny fellow. On the way, we find an NCR outpost and meet a young woman named Veronica, who reveals to us that she is a member of the Brotherhood of Steel, a group that seeks to protect the world from technology by seizing it for themselves. Though we are impressed by the Brotherhood, we are frustrated at the refusal to share the technology with the world. By hiding technology away, the Brotherhood is almost just as backwards as the Legion in our eyes. However, the Legion actually has an excuse, whereas the Brotherhood benefits greatly from their technology while preventing humanity from truly benefiting in general. We express this to Veronica, and it seems that she essentially agrees with us and decides to join Eddie and Musk on their adventure. We follow the short path to Boulder City and find an ongoing hostage situation between the NCR forces and the Great Cons. We're able to talk our way in and make our way to the building where the leaders of the gang are holding out. The cons easily tell us where Benny can be found and we leave on our way to New Vegas. We have little interest in this conflict between the cons and the NCR. We'll leave them to resolve this on their own. On our way to New Vegas, we find the Robco headquarters and journey in to see if there's any tech that has been left undisturbed after all this time. We easily hack a few computers and make our way through the facility. All of this culminates with us making our way to the back room where we find a unique plasma rifle, the Q35 Matter Modulator, along with other valuable goods. On our way out, we run into the consequences of messing with the Legion, and are attacked by a group of well-armed assassins. However, this isn't enough to take us down with our new rifle and copious amounts of drugs that we can take. From here, it's not too far to walk to Freeside, which is our last stop before we finally make it onto the Strip. Evolution is one concept that is constantly brought up by transhumanists. The idea is used to draw connections to the idea of continual improvement in all aspects of human civilization. I would not be surprised if many transhumanists find kinship with Steven Pinker. Steven Pinker, in Enlightenment Now, lays out his thesis that though our reporting of events has been very negative in the last few decades, in truth the world has become much better, on the most part. Pinker associates this improvement with the collapse of traditional religion and the development of reason and science out of the Enlightenment. The transhumanist quest is to find the continual improvements that may bring humanity into our next stage of evolution. What this could be, no one is really sure. However, many point to technologies such as CRISPR as a pathway to human-led evolution. In another aspect, transhumanist Juan Enriquez, in a TED talk, lays out his thesis that all moral improvements we find in society are tied to the development of technology. When you have an alternative, and you don't have to go vegetarian, and you can still eat meat, in one generation, how do you think 
people are going to treat a picture like this. When there are clear alternatives that are by technology, so we don't have to do this, how do you think they're going to judge us? And there's a whole series of other examples of things that we might be doing today that technology is going to displace the ethics and move the ethical goalposts. And it's important to understand that both in how we judge people in the past, not justify it. I'm not justifying slavery. I'm not defending slavery. I'm not defending discrimination against gays. I'm not defending any of this stuff. But we are going to be judged. And there's far more of a record of how we're going to be judged because we've all been covered by electronic tattoos that aren't going to disappear. Whether you call it Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever else, people are going to be able to look in detail. In a way, he seems to argue that we are all able to agree that an act is evil only once we have no need for it anymore. If we look at the practice of slavery, he may say that it was always wrong. However, we did not have the technology to afford to call it wrong. Therefore, it was not abolitionists who truly eliminated the horrific practice of chattel slavery in the United States, but the Industrial Revolution that ultimately ended the practice. Out of this admiration of the mindless process of evolution, transhumanists have been inspired. Evolution may be a road, everything getting better. And why would we not want to run down it as fast as we possibly can? Accelerate. Accelerate. Let's just keep going. Faster, faster, faster. <laughs> On entering Freeside, one thing is very obvious to us. Whatever type of robot Victor was, the strip is filled with robots like him. It's then that we decide that whoever is in charge here, we are very interested in them. First up though, we need to make enough caps to even get inside the strip. As we made our way towards New Vegas, it was hard to miss the numerous advertisements for the Silver Rush a weapons shop run by the Van Graffs. Their gimmick is energy weapons, so they're right up our alley. We make our way over when we're in town and watch as the Van Graffs show how they can microwave cook a living being with their guns. We take on a job to guard their front door and quickly deliver a package for them. It's some easy money, but not nearly enough for what we're going to need. The Kings, are a gang of Elvis impersonators that hold a significant amount of pull around Freeside. While it might be strange for us to immediately start helping this crew out with their jobs, we notice that their leader has something we want, a cyborg dog. We do everything they ask, from killing a fake bodyguard and his friends, to investigating an NCR charity that doesn't seem to serve the local population. I'm not sure if it's the fact that we got pulled into the situation, or if we're just starting to get fed up with the NCR at this point. However, we kick them out of Freeside for the Kings, and as a reward, we get to take care of Rex, our new robot dog companion. While all this is happening, we begin our career as a professional gambler. With our high base luck stat and the assistance of luck increasing technologies, such as some clothes we bought from Mick and Ralph's, and a luck implant, we were able to wipe the floor with Blackjack. We go into the Atomic Wrangler with a swagger in our step, and walk out with a small fortune. We also get kicked out, but we just move on. We're easily able to pass the credit check to make it onto the strip once we remember to cash in our chips, and we begin to make our rounds on the strip. Starting with Gamora, we take the casinos for all they're worth. We get several cooked meals, which we subsequently throw on the floor as they're not pre-packaged like we like them. However, we do get an amazing set of armor, and after a bit of gambling at the Ultralux, we get a room key where we will sleep for one of the only two times this entire run. The next morning, we head out with Veronica and Eddie to the Lucky 38, where we seem to suddenly remember why we're here in the first place. We sit down to do some last gambling before we do what we came here for. Once we become independently wealthy enough to pay for a day of the national US military spending, we take the chance to prepare 
to buy the implants. And we do that. Our endurance is set so high, we're able to load up on all the chrome we need to make sure that Benny has a bad day. The strip wasn't ready for that day. Elon returned to the Lucky 38 and was ready for business. He was asked to disarm, but it wasn't happening. He proceeded to do all the drugs and unload his weapons indiscriminately on everyone in the casino. No one would dare try to take his life again. After a stretch of the firefight, Benny asked for mercy, but Elon would not relent. After killing everyone in sight, he recovered what had been taken from him, a single platinum chip, and he had a strange feeling about it. This single chip would be the key to bringing this little city at the edge of a wasteland into the center of civilization and human development. Elon continued to hear rumors about Mr. House and is welcomed into the house residence by an old friend, Victor. He expected to meet a man much like himself, and he was half right. Mr. House was like him. However, he was a man no longer. Mr. House had become a machine. House had become essentially immortal, and Elon could not be more pleased by this turn of events. CRISPR <laughs> CRISPR General Artificial Intelligence, or AGI Cyborg Technologies Anti-Aging Technologies This is just a huge wave of life-changing and potentially catastrophic technologies that seem inevitable. In the face of this, the transhumanist sees only one good option you can't fight it. What good would that do? No. It's better to be on the right side of history, and move with the wave rather than fight against it. This seems most reasonable when considering the role that AGI will play in the future. Let's just say that artificial intelligence achieves consciousness in the future, and that the singularity occurs. This AI is able to program itself, improve on its own. This AI would be like a god compared to us. Do you want to be on its bad side? If we continue to work on the side of progress, we should never have to worry about such a situation. Embrace the future, and reject the traditions that hold us back. The script on Marx's tombstone seems apt here. The only thing that you have to lose are your chains. Where the personal morality of a transhumanist seems ill-defined, the politics seem very clear. By whatever means necessary, make sure that technology continues so that humanity may finally prosper in a state free from death and disease. Max Moore has made it clear in the past that the transhumanist project is always improving and never done. But that doesn't stop the vision. A vision in which we can do whatever and be whoever we want. Complete and utter freedom from any boundaries that have held humanity back. Such a fierce goal needs to be met with some sort of method. And here is where things can get a bit tricky. How do we reach this destination the quickest and most reliably? There are certainly some who would follow the ideals of Marx to bring about this future, and many more who see political libertarianism and free markets as the best motivators of scientific development. All of these tools are at the transhumanist's fingertips as long as they believe in the core principles. The best future is to be found in science and reason, and a good helping of post-enlightenment humanism. The latter may be controversial to some, however the leaders of the transhumanist movements don't seem to care for the title of post-humanism. They seek to improve on what is there and make sure that humanity survives in whatever form that evolution takes us. Mr. House whose values closely align with ours, takes the platinum chip and shows us its true power. It allows for the weapon systems of his Securitrons to be upgraded and allows for greater control of the strips and the surrounding areas. He then sends us on a mission to continue to access more reserves of his robotic army. In the process, he reveals himself to be the president of Robco and 
we didn't realize we could fall more in love with the man. We make the visit to the Legion as they control the fort that holds House's reserves, and we continue to be appalled by their inherent philosophy. We quickly see that their technology is inadequate, and convince Caesar to let us into the fort where we will disable the security and activate the robots at House's request. In our travels to help out our friend Rex, we make our way to a settlement by the name of Jacob's Town. We meet a super mutant at the gate named Marcus, and we are genu genuinely impressed by this community. There is a heavy focus on keeping this offshoot of humanity alive, and continuing to improve with the help of a local scientist. We shoo off some NCR thugs and get Rex refitted with a new brain before moving on to House's next mission. Next up, House told us that the Boomers were a valuable asset, and he was not wrong. The Boomers are a promising partner faction. They possess and highly value their military technology. We gladly support their needs for more tech to fuel their addiction to explosions and move on to one of the last tasks before us. Oh, we also talk our way into Helios 1, and while we're in the area collecting solar panels that we really didn't need, we end up redirecting all the power to the strip and make sure that House's supremacy continues. Oh, and one more footnote, we also stop an assassination of the NCR president, but it really wasn't interesting, so I just wanted to kind of pass by it. Jeremy Bentham, um, I decided against my, 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 my better judgment to show his severed head, but it's out there. You can, you can look it up. He, he took his head and, and gave it away, or he gave away his body, but they, they kept his head around and it is really creepy. So if you're into that thing, you should look it up. Um, but he's an Englishman with the name of a Quaker. And John Stuart Mill, a man who always makes me think of the Mouse Boy from that M Night movie, were thinkers behind the moral philosophy we know as we know today as hedonism and also utilitarianism. My primitive caveman definition would be that utilitarianism says that an action's moral quality is decided by the outcome of the action, whereas hedonism says that the ultimate goal is a minimization of pain, and a maximization of pleasure. It's hard not to see the strong influences these philosophies had on the transhumanist movement. Everything from a vision of an ideal world of freedom to a shared disdain for traditional religion as an ignorant and unreasonable method of deriving good. Why follow an ancient rulebook when we can do research and find what is morally right? Whatever serves to help the most people and ease their suffering the most, it seems pretty obvious that we ought to do that thing. At the core of the transhumanist being is this unrelenting drive towards an obvious good. And it can be easy to understand why calls to slow the world down may sound like the greatest blasphemy of all. To call for restrictions on the research would be to stop the very progress of society. Sacrifices must be made but it's all for the greater good of humanity as a whole. There is one threat that House sees to his full autonomy that we must deal with before the Battle of Hoover Dam. The Brotherhood of Steel seems like it would align with our values at first glance, but as I mentioned before when we first met Veronica, they're really on the other side of reverence for technology. To them, technology is something to be revered and feared. Fear is a primitive and base emotion. It's unsurprising to us that the Brotherhood have so many rituals around technology. In truth, they're just another fundamentalist religious faction that will just get in the way of new humanity. We say our final goodbyes to Veronica. We know what we have to do, and we know we can't face her after all of this is over. We leave Rex and Eddie too, we don't want them to get trapped in the crossfire. We find the Brotherhood base, and are immediately taken hostage. In exchange for our freedom, we are tasked with killing an NCR Ranger. The NCR are doomed anyways, so we have no problem taking one Ranger off our list. When we return to get our supplies back and have the bomb collar removed from our neck- Oh, 
Did I forget to mention that? Yes, the Brotherhood of Steel have placed a bomb collar around our neck and forced us to kill a man who happened to be camping in the area. Then they just let us roam around their base freely. This is a this is a big mistake. We proceed to hack their turret consoles and change the targeting parameters to the entire Brotherhood directory of members. This wipes out most of the heavily armored paladins, including their elder, and as we make our way over to the self-destruct panel and initiate the destruction of the entire base, we're just kind of free to run through. Um, up until that point, no one has a problem. And you know what? Good riddance, Brotherhood. I hope you are all wiped out into obscurity. We solve a quick issue with the NCR controlled power station and prepare for the Battle of Hoover Dam. With the help of Rex and some Securitrons, we make it into the interior of the dam where we sneak by some guards with a stealth boy and print off some very important paper for later. We continue on one last time to redirect power to the Securitron army and make our way to start the final assault on the Legion. We take almost all the drugs again and snipe away at Legion soldiers. We confront Legate Lanius and decide it's not even worth talking to him and kill him along with the other Legion cronies. However, we don't complete this before our loyal companion Rex dies. His sacrifice will echo through the ages as the one that led to a truly free New Vegas. On our bittersweet victory, we move to exit the camp and come face to face with NCR General Lee Oliver. Oliver, thinking he has won, is flabbergasted when we pull out the terms of his unconditional surrender. Not fully understanding that the game was rigged from the start, we decide to end the NCR swiftly and bring about a free New Vegas. The credits don't have much to offer us. House continues to rule with the help of the kings and preside. Jacobstown continues to thrive, assuming we help with research, and Prim Slim is the greatest sheriff the world has ever seen. And Novak is alright too, I guess. So where does this leave us when considering transhumanism on the whole? In my research, I watched Philosophy Tube's video on the subject, and the one criticism that came at the end of the video was essentially the one from the political left. As technology develops, there's not a clear path that shows that the impoverished will be taken care of. However, this is more of a general criticism that can be avoided by the likes of folks like Juan Enriquez, who simply tie moral progress to technology. And understanding that all improvements are incremental provides a good counter to this issue. And don't forget Zoltan's advocacy for universal basic income. The whole platform of that side of transhumanism is all about taking care of, you know, the little guy. The person who might be walked all over. So I don't see that as the main challenge that transhumanism has to face. My challenges to transhumanism lie closer to the heart of the movement. First, the cost of technology seems to be often looked over. Enriquez is convinced by his thesis that technology corresponds directly to moral improvements. However, it doesn't take long to find counters to this argument. Early in the Industrial Revolution, Eli Whitney, an American inventor, created a new type of cotton gin that he thought would reduce the needs for slave labor for the production of cotton. Now, a transhumanist who doesn't know the full story would be all for the progression of this industrial technology. However, Whitney's cotton gin had the opposite effect. At the time, the practice of slavery seemed to begin to die out. This new cotton gin, instead of ending the practice, breathed new life into it. As the process for cleaning cotton was easier and the process became more efficient, fewer slaves could work more land, and this would make the owners of these plantations much more money. This could be an isolated incident, except this is one of the oldest types of stories we can imagine. The utilization of atomic energy was one of the greatest leaps in understanding the fabric of our universe. Fission could be used to power millions of homes and better lives for everyone with a wire connecting them to the grid. But you see where I'm going with this. Despite all the good that nuclear power 
correctly harnessed could do. It can be difficult to frame the jump as worthwhile when considering the uncountable numbers of people who have lost their lives to atomic bombs, a threat that will never go away. Pandora's box is an ancient legend, like the fire of Prometheus, which provides an analog to technology. Pandora was ignorant of what was inside the box and was told by the divines not to open it. However, she, in her curiosity, opened the box nonetheless. Through this, all the troubles of the world were unleashed. The transhumanists can try and discount these ancient myths and religions all they want, but when we reflect on these stories, we see a great irony. These may be the most advanced forms of technology we know of. The story is how we interpret everything. And not just this story, but every story. A list of facts is not a good replacement for a story. In fact, a list of facts is very boring. However, a story has more than just facts. It contains interpretable information. If I say, I was bit by a dog today to my wife, what is she going to ask me to do once she is sure I'm okay? If you have an ounce of social intelligence, you know that she's going to want to know the story. What dog? Where was it? Why was I attacked? What were the events that led up to and followed such a significant moment? She wants the story. Transhumanists like Max Moore may be frustrated by the accusations of posthumanism, but in the words of Chesterton, it's a shame that people didn't call him that more often. This is a tangent that can be an entire piece on its own, so let's continue to move on. I was very careful in the previous section not to bring up cases of scientists working on technology in a traditionally unethical way. Whitney was by all accounts a much more humane man than the scientists in the Nazi death camps. But let's bring this up. What stops the transhumanists from going off the deep end and bisecting people alive to develop anti-aging technologies, for example? Transhumanists like Max Moore would point out the role of reason as his guiding principle. And I might be taking a step too far, when I hear this, it screams of secular humanism. My second major challenge to the transhumanist is against the foundations of this secular humanism. I have long struggled to understand how one can derive an ought from an empirical is. There is no empirical fact that says that we should not do anything. Just because something is a certain way does not mean that it ought to be that way. It seems to me that a scientist can get away with experimenting on orphans. No one is particularly looking for them. Anesthesia would be a way to prevent the presence of pain. Imagine the good it could do the world. We, for over a thousand years, built our morality on religious structures, and it's concerning when we are challenged without a trustworthy alternative. Sense of morality is not universal, and it is sensible to have guardrails that may not make sense to everyone. However, they will check the excesses of those that seek to commit, you know, war crimes in the name of progress. I want to address the challenge very quickly that somebody might say, because an action would cause harm, therefore it should be immoral. This isn't enough. You need a guiding principle. There's no empirical evidence in the world that we should prioritize human well-being. Evolution isn't enough to make that argument, because evolution's all about adaptation. Evolution results in the extinction of many maladapted species. So there's no claim that we ought to be the species that survives. There's something attractive about the idea that reason will lead us to a great tomorrow. And the concept of evolution is carried out every step of the way as proof of this in action. However, it is entirely incorrect to understand evolution in this way. Evolution is not progressive. It is adaptive. When we look at cases of butterflies that change color to match the soot covering surroundings post-pollution, we are not looking at a better being. We are looking at an adapted being. When the soot was removed from the environment, do you think the butterflies that evolved to match the soot would perform better than the old adapted camouflaged ones? No. This is because evolution is adaptive. These new butterflies that are soot colored are not better than the old ones. They are adapted to the environment that they live in. It is a mindless process that selects creatures that are both able to adapt to the environment and reproduce. To point to evolution as a support for transhumanism is the most science illiterate thing I've heard from those 
that claims to be all about science. I get it though. Within this framework, it's hard to gauge progress. How do we know we are getting closer to the goal? Enriquez will at least point to the idea that one part of the goal is to be prepared to adapt to whatever situation humanity finds themselves in. But it's not clear to me why we ought to be so concerned with the ultimate fate of mankind. If this final stage of adaptation is to be uploaded to an interplanetary network and saved so that we can copy our consciousness in a way that will never be lost, then I think you've lost what it means to be human. This brings me to my final and potentially my most controversial point. To be human is to have limitations. To remove limitations is to remove humanity. We are not defined by our great deeds, but our small ones. How can I share with my neighbor if we both live in utter abundance? We can all choose forms of self-imposed limitations like monogamy or a diet, but true love is found in sacrifice for one another. For a millionaire to give $50 to charity is a joke, but for a woman who works for minimum wage and struggles for what she has, $50 means everything. This sacrifice is a true expression of love. She may not be able to afford what she wants, and she may have to rely on the help of her community, but in the end, she is much more admirable. I would rather have her humanity for just a few years than to live forever in the Matrix. However, these are just my thoughts. Uh, there's plenty of room for disagreement, and I'd love to hear it from you all. So, please go down in the comments, let me know what you think. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. I know this was a, a bit of a longer one, this is kind of a, a trick to make. And please leave a like and subscribe if you made it this far for more stuff like this. I really appreciate it. and. I hope to see you all again soon. I'm going to keep working on stuff like this, and I'm excited. Oh, my God.